I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm presenting some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literature and cultural studies. This particular installment is one of a group on Joseph Conrad's novella, Heart of Darkness. And here I'll be saying some things about Conrad's relationship to the beginning of a decline in confidence in the values and assumptions of the European Enlightenment at the beginning of the 20th century. So I want to begin today talking about late modernity and what was happening in the first decades of the 20th century. And this first image I've shown you here shows the British possessions in Africa and Asia, also the French possessions in blue and in lighter orange, Portugal and its possessions, and Germany had some colonial holdings in, in Africa. They were about to lose those in World War I. So those were the colonial holdings around 1900. By the time of the Victorian era, Queen Victoria reigned from 1845 to 1900, the end of Queen Victoria's reign, and in the first decades of the 20th century, some British writers and intellectuals were beginning to become disillusioned and disenchanted with the idea of the British Empire as civilizing the so-called savages. So these writers and intellectuals of the early 20th century were disillusioned and disenchanted with the confident and even arrogant assumptions of cultural superiority and moral righteousness of the late 19th century. And already Conrad was onto that in the 1890s. The editors say in Conrad's Heart of Darkness, the narrator, Charlie Marlowe, suffers from a sort of a moral vertigo. Charlie Marlowe, the sailor, is quite comfortable on a ship out in the ocean. There, he knows what to expect. The conditions are limited. Everyone has to depend on each other out on the ocean, and it's a comfortable, familiar place to him. When he goes on land, though, he does not know whom he can trust. And at the end of this novel, of this novella, this short novel, he's going to have to go and tell the fiance of Kurtz, the traitor, from the interior of Africa, who has died. He's gonna to have to tell Kurtz's fiance how he died, what he was really like at the end. And it's not a pretty picture. Marlowe always wants to tell the truth when he finds when he has to go tell this innocent young lady who's Kurtz's fiance and who has this very high opinion of Kurtz's moral stature. He's gonna to have to tell her that he was really degraded that he was all about greed, that he had gone crazy and was brutalizing the local population, and that his methods of bringing in the most ivory of any outstation were quite irregular and quite unethical, murderous, really. He can't do it. Marlowe says, it seemed to me that the house would collapse before I could escape if I told this lie that the heavens would fall upon my head, but nothing happened. The heavens do not fall for such a trifle. The editors go on to say, in works like these, a voyage is undertaken into a vast, unknown, dark expanse. Those few who come out alive have seen too much ever to be the same. That's the condition of modernity, facing an abyss when we no longer can depend upon the moral certitudes that had been taken for granted, certainly in the Middle Ages. Certainly back to Beowulf's time, when a man was a man and a courageous ax built for itself. Certainly in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, when even though Chaucer will be satirizing the corruption in the church and some of the bad behavior of these clerical figures, nonetheless, Everyone assumed that there was a God, that God ordained this hierarchy under which society was ordered. There was no point in questioning it. It could be taken for granted. But with modernity among such changes 
as the transatlantic exploration and the encounter with alien cultures, with totally different value systems, with no knowledge of the tradition that the Europeans had been taking for granted, with the disruptions to the economic and political order that would come with urbanization, with the beginnings of early industrialism, with the rise of the merchant class, with the Protestant Reformation and the printing press, which called into question the authority, the heretofore unquestioned authority of the Catholic Church. Those things begin to break down the assumption of obvious self-evident order, right, truth, morality, that had been characteristic of the pre-modern society. All that might bring us in the 1880s to Friedrich Nietzsche. Some of you encountered Nietzsche before, perhaps. Very famous philosopher and one who's had a lot of influence. Such phrases as, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger, is a Nietzschean phrase. But one of the most famous ones you probably heard was his observation that God is dead. You often hear that, at least I did when I was growing up, someone would say, well, they say God is dead, but I spoke to him this morning. I think what Nietzsche meant in saying that God is dead was that it's impossible in 1882, impossible to experience the divine in the same way that it could be experienced by someone living at Chaucer's time in 1482, 400 years earlier. In 1882, one could no longer take for granted that God had ordained this particular social order, that God had placed each person in this place in the social order according to his divine will, and that every part of this was self-evident that one's life was laid out. It was Nietzsche's attempt to liberate humanity from what he saw as the false consciousness of adherence to a set of prescribed behaviors and attitudes and values that inhibited freedom and held people back. And he has a whole range of these uh, things. Well, for one, for example, Nietzsche criticized the concept of hope. That's one I can't quite agree on with him. My, my favorite Bible verse is um, from the fifth chapter of Romans, and it's in abbreviated form, hope maketh not ashamed, for the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. A kind of a hopeful assertion of, for me, of the extension of charity and goodwill, even though sometimes it may seem foolish, really speaks to me. Nietzsche, thought that hope was a bill of goods sold to people by the Christian church, beginning with St. Paul, continuing with St. Thomas Aquinas. That was always false hope. And it always encouraged people to lay back and be fatalistic and just hope for something better instead of taking an active role in trying to make things better for yourself. That was Nietzsche's critique. So the editors go on to say Conrad's tragic figure, Kurtz, and also George Bernard Shaw's comic professor Henry Higgins in My Fair Lady, Big Malian, represent two very different takes on this idea, building on Nietzsche's interest in showing how all values are constructed rather than given, at some level arbitrary, all truths being merely opinions, all social identities merely roles. I don't think that all truths are merely opinions or that all values are merely constructs, but I will say that effectively understandings of value are contingent and they're only operative in a community, only operative when there's some agreement upon what is a value or what is the truth. If one holds a truth that is really the truth all by oneself, it doesn't have any effect. For a truth to be effective, it, there has to be some agreement. 
There has to be rhetoric. There has to be an argument of persuasion so that a community will accept this truth as a truth. Now, so this leads to, in the later 20th century, the concept of the social construction of reality. Freud enters in, uh, in his interpretation of dreams and in his psychopathology of everyday life in 1900 and 1901, respectively. Freud's works illustrate in an especially vivid way his evolving theories about the influence of the unconscious mind and past experiences, especially childhood experiences on everyday life. Things that we're not even really quite aware of that may bubble up in our dreams, but have a locus, have a source in the communal consciousness of the societies in which we are raised. Filter into our minds while we're not really paying close attention, not actively learning, only passively absorbing. These things Freud noticed have an effect on how we act. So we're not exactly free agents. That's in contrast, by the way, to an idea that Milton might have wanted to assert in Paradise Lost, or that Shakespeare would assert in Hamlet, that Rene Descartes would be asserting when he said, I think, therefore I am. And it's related, in a way, to the questioning of Newtonian physics from Einstein's special theory of relativity. In Einstein's theory, dealing with motion, and later in the general theory of relativity, dealing with gravity, Einstein shook the traditional understanding of the universe and our relationship to it. So the uncertainty of Einstein's universe was seemingly reinforced by developments in quantum physics, such as in the works of Werner Heisenberg, the author of the famous Uncertainty Principle and the Principle of Complementarity, all of which assert that the movement of subatomic particles can only be predicted by probability and not measured precisely. So, just at this time, intellectuals and writers were connecting these dots. And the editors, Kevin Dittmer and Julie Wick, the editors of our anthology, they write, the modern writer was faced with an enormous Nietzschean task to create new and appropriate values for modern culture and a style appropriate to those values. As a consequence, there's often a probing, nervous quality in the modernist explorations of ultimate questions. This quality can be seen at the very start of the century in Conrad's Heart of Darkness, a novel about psychological depth and social disintegration that simultaneously implicates its readers in the moral ambiguities of its events. These ambiguities, moreover, are reflected in the very presentation of the narrative itself. In the modern novel, we are no longer allowed to watch from a safe distance while our protagonists mature and change through their trials. Instead, we are made to undergo those trials ourselves through the machinations of the narrative. Okay, the point here is, in the modern novel often, even in its structure and the way it engages the reader, it doesn't give the reader a comfortable, safe space to stand on and observe the protagonist learn how to be a mature grown-up. The critiques of Karl Marx, Marx's critique of the notion of agency and individualism in Cartesian thought. The members of the workforce, which Marx had called alienated labor, were seen to be estranged, not just from their work, but from one another as well, as they themselves became mass products. This situation is dramatized, especially vividly, in the silent films of the 1920s, from the dystopian vision of Fritz Lang's metropolis to the more comic vision presented by Charlie Chaplin in modern times. So industrialization, urbanization, new developments in science, the breakdown of traditional religious communities, the breakdown of local communities. This was already happening in the late 19th century, and it has accelerated to the point at which now, in our lifetimes, 
We've seen smartphones, now the Internet of Things, and it's easy to see how those technological changes promote the fragmentation of community, how they change what it means to be human. Even in 10 years or so, it has been going on for 500 years. That's where I'll end this webcast. But in another installment, I'll have more to say about the turn of the 20th century disenchantment with the moral certitudes of the Enlightenment tradition. Meanwhile, if you have questions or comments, send me an email.